My name is Miss Olette. For those of you who don't know who I am, it's nice to meet you and thanks for coming today. Um, I'd like to welcome you today to My Career, My Future presentation featuring Mr. Adam Dow from Dow Realty Group. Um, Adam was born and raised in Wolfboro and he's a King was Kingswood alumni from 92, class of 92. Um, and today he's just gonna share some things and some books that he wished he had read when he was around your age, maybe a little bit older. Um, he's also gonna talk about you know, the benefits of working as a team. Obviously, he built a great team over at Dell Realty Group and things like that. Um, and then just how you can create a life-fulfilling career and not just a career that is a job. You go to work, you come home, things like that. So um, please join me in welcoming Mr. Dell. Hello. <laughs> Troy is right here, he's my son, so he's probably going to be the one with the red face the whole time. Uh, I'm going to start by saying, yes, I did go to school here at Class of 92. I was uh, FBLA. I know some of you guys are here too. Um, so it's kind of weird being back here. One dollar. The key to business, I brought some Monopoly money too. If you guys, the soccer players, if you could come down here for a second. You gotta have to be able to do a push-up. Uh, all right, hockey players too, or anybody who wants to do a push-up, but I just know the, these guys more. All right, you can do a push-up. All right, Troy, if you could go over here. You two stay, Healy, stay here. Yo, Harry, I know you can do a push-up. Come down here. I know you can do a push-up, come on. All right. All right, Morrissey, you're by yourself, but these, this is your company here. This is my company? Yep. So. Let's go. <laughs> All right, here, here's a dollar. Everyone, take a dollar and pass it down. I'm going to have more dollars. All right. You two get a dollar. Actually. You get a dollar, and you get a dollar. All right. Um, actually, you get two dollars, and you get two dollars. All right. So you two will do one push-up. I'm going to pay you two dollars for doing the push-up. All right. Do a push-up. All right. You can keep the two dollars. All right. So if you guys do both do a push-up. All right. I'm going to give you a dollar for your push-up and for his push-up. All right, all of you do a push-up. You stay standing. <laughs> all right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You get eight dollars. Nine. You already got your money. Where's my guy? Eight. All right. That's it. You guys could all sit back down. <laughs> no, we need a, it's our Monopoly game. We gotta keep we gotta take that back. We didn't get a dollar. Everyone should have got a dollar. Alright, so what did you guys learn? Who made out the best in that situation? <laughs> Who thought it was unfair? Healy thought it was unfair. Why was it unfair? Because I got like three dollars. You probably got nine. And he didn't do a push-up. Is that fair? I mean, everyone did one push-up, right? Except for Carter. So maybe that's a little bit unfair. But I'm going to get into uh, the cash flow quadrant. I don't know if you guys have read. Rich dad, poor dad, yet, or will, but that's one of the keys to business. So let me just go to the next slide. So a little bit about me. This is from my real estate slide, but um, number 43 of 180,000 realtors in the country for Keller Williams. I am a luxury home you know, real estate agent. 
top 10 in New England, actually I think number two right now. Uh, I also am a part of a, a group that's professional athletes and enter entertainers. Sold some houses to some people that you would recognize their name. Um, and in New Hampshire, I've been number one in real estate since 2015 uh, in one way or the other. So what is up there is kind of flashy. You know, obviously I use that to try and get listings. Uh, what's not up there is, you know, I came to school. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Got into business because my math SAT was so much better than my English one. There was no way I was going to do anything else but something in the math field. I thought if I was in business, I could always make money somehow. But I didn't have a clear direction. I was your age and didn't know what I was going to do. Went off to business school. Same thing. I didn't really have intention around what I was going to do. Got a job as a resume booster and basically spent nine years helping biz build a business that gave me pretty good business expertise. Um, but it, it actually, it was a dot com that failed in 2001. They owed me $40,000 and I had just moved back to Wolfboro because I wanted to raise a family here. And I was like, all right, I still don't know what I want to do. Got into real estate, it matched what I wanted to do. And it's produced a very good business. So what I'm going to go through today is, you know, you guys are sitting here wondering what's my passion, what am I going to do? Maybe not even wondering those things, but if you think about some things sooner than later, you're going to set yourself up for success later in life. And that doesn't necessarily mean money. It could. It also means time. It means uh, having uh, the ability to have just personal freedom going on a trip when you want to go on a trip, taking time off if you're sick to help somebody else. You know, some of these things that if you start now, it's going to really help. So it was cool yesterday. Uh, I had awards luncheon for my team. Um, I got to hand out 11 awards for people that made over six figures. Um, you know, that's kind of my goal for my real estate team. The success through others is if I can have a world that's big enough to have other people successful in it, uh, especially in New Hampshire, it's hard to make six figures in New Hampshire. Um, and so it was, a, it was a pleasure for me to, to hand out the, we called it the Century Club Awards. So 11 people got those yesterday. Um, one person's almost, I think she might make a half a million. And it's, um, that's exciting to me. That, that's what drives me. It's, I've found that that's something that helps me go to work and want to help others achieve at a high level because in the back end, if I have 10 people that are successful, that means I'm also being successful through them. Um, but the other part of it is in real estate, you get to meet really cool people. Uh, there's a guy that I met, Tim Chisuli, uh, who bought a house probably seven years ago. He has since torn it down and built a fantastic home, but he just sold his company for $115 million. Um, and it's a company that he built over 48 years. And because of the relationship I have with him and becoming friends with him, he came and spoke to our team yesterday. So it was kind of cool to have this amazing business person come in and tell about his 48 years of experience that led to this end event. And this is what he started with. Um, and I changed it because he said in the last 20 years, but I'm putting in your lifetime, uh, the world has been drastically transformed by events like September 11th, Black Friday, market crashes, and obviously the p pandemic. The speed of change due to the technology, technological shift in the way we communicate is accelerating. Never before in the history of mankind have we as humans had to deal with such rapid change. This has created a deep and profound fear in the world, and he defined fear as false evidence appearing real. You know, we have, depending on what station you're watching, you have evidence there. You know, some of it's real, some of it's not real. You guys have the challenge of trying to figure out, you know, it's, I didn't have the same challenge that you guys have. You have to really know what you don't know uh, and research to make sure you know or <laughs> what you believe to be true is true. So false evidence appearing real. For some, it's absolutely paralyzing. And for some, it's opened up incredible opportunity. So that's what I want to talk about today. 
you know, with challenges come opportunity, and there's a whole bunch of challenges going on in today's world that you guys can take advantage of starting whenever you want to start. To master change, develop the discipline of managing the unexpected. The best way to do that is to become massively competent. So in the awards banquet yesterday, I talked about our craft. You know, in real estate, what do you think our craft is? Persuasion, okay, what else? And my phone's ringing, that's probably bad. There we go, what else? I think negotiating with others. Okay, negotiating, that's definitely one of them. What, Healy? Oh, I can't think of Yep, so relationships. Yep, listening. So, I mean, I use the example, um, if I'm showing a house and I walk into a house and I'm telling somebody, hey, look at this giant backyard. Isn't it green, isn't it beautiful, and all that kind of stuff. And I haven't listened, if I was a buyer, to myself as a buyer. Like, if I looked at that lawn, I would say, all right, I don't wanna buy this house. I don't like mowing the lawn. Like, so for me, what might be beneficial in a house is different from somebody else that takes pride in the lawn and they want to have the lines in the lawn and all that kind of stuff. That's not me. So listening uh, is definitely you know, part of it. Negotiating is definitely part of it. If I can't negotiate, you know, people are paying me a lot of money to get them either a really good price for their home, to find them the right home, but it's all through negotiation. And negotiation starts right when they walk in the door, listening to what their motivation is so I can Talk to the seller about, you know, these people are moving here in two weeks. You know, they're, you might want to hold to your price. Um, but, and then you negotiate with the appraiser. Then you negotiate with the title company. So it's all negotiation. So negotiation shoots. So yesterday when I was talking, it's mastering your craft. If you have done it over and over and over again, you can have confidence in it and you can, you can do it well. So I just wanted to throw some questions out there. How do people get money? Working. Working, job, exactly. That was Troy. He got a dollar, <laughs> which isn't bad. Well, how else do people get money? Sometimes it's passed down through generations. So if, uh, if the family members have money and then the parents die, it's in the will for the kids to get money. Yep, okay. absolutely. Inheritance. Stealing, yep, dishonesty, yeah. How else do people get money? Yep. Investments, absolutely, yep. What does money do for people? It's a tool. Yep, can. And I like talking about money and the happiness and you, know, you talked about the seven figure income, like the, money's kind of the only taboo topic left. Like some homes they'll talk all about it, some homes they won't talk about it, but it's so important to us as humans to get through uh, our life that it, it has to be. So does happiness come with money? Who knows? What else? What does money do for people? Could bring your time, correct. Actually, I have that up there. So what is debt? That's, it can, debt can lead to that, yep. Yes, because of the debt. So debt, like if you wanted to buy a car and you didn't have $10,000 to buy the car, you could go to a bank and you'd be in debt with them. So you can pay a mortgage for a house. Yep, that's another type of debt. 
So if you get into more of the studies, you have good debt, bad debt, things like that. But generally, debt is money that you owe somebody else, a person or an institution. Why do people go into debt? Yeah. Yeah. They kind of get ahead of themselves and make poor choices, poor decisions without realizing that they don't have enough money. So yeah, so now we're we're kind of coming up with the you know, fear the the false evidence appearing real. Debt is a very dangerous thing, but it's not always bad, right? You can, you can go and rent a TV. Do you think that's good debt? Go to rent a center and buy a 70 inch or not even buy, rent it. Like, so there, there's, there's not so good debt. Or you can say, all right, I'm gonna buy a house, but I'm gonna buy a duplex. And I'm gonna own the whole thing and I'm gonna let my buddy stay in a couple bedrooms and then I'm gonna rent the other side. So every month, because I own the house, I'm gonna get $400 a month and everybody else is gonna help me pay for it because you took out a loan to get that house. Would that be good debt? Yeah. And that's yeah, a pretty good thing. So think duplex. As you're getting to your 20s before buying your first house, maybe think duplex. That might make you a lot of money later. So what is time? Time is money, I like that. So does somebody have more hours in the day than other people? Yes, and you can also have debt when it comes to time. Like maybe you need more time to work on something than you actually have. I would agree with that. I mean, so time, how you invest time. So we're get, kind of getting to the, the next part of it. You know, the, the most important asset that you have right now is time. That's the absolute, your biggest asset right now is time. I've got a slide in here of talk about stocks. Like if you started at 25 and 35, investing the exact same amount, amount at the age of 60, you'll have double if you had started at 25 than if you started at 35. So time right now is, is your greatest asset. Compounding interest, all of those things that you could learn about. So I'm just gonna try and do top of the waves type stuff for you guys, but so time, so do you think Carter would have more time during the week or Troy? If he's got eight people doing a push-up for him and he's holding $8 and $9 and Troy has to do a push-up for every dollar he makes, who's going to have more time? Yes. So when you're thinking about how to invest your time, you want to, everybody's going to, spend 40 hours on work week, potentially. Yeah, right now, time, like for, when I talk to a new real estate agent, that's their biggest investment, right? I mean, that's their biggest asset right now, time. Like if they got a listing, they actually have the time to call every other realtor in the area and tell them about their new listing. And that would be a competitive advantage for them because I don't have time to do that with, you know, a number of listings. So I tell them to, to leverage what they have as their biggest asset. And, you know, sometimes for, for newer people, it's time because they're still learning the business. They're not so busy in the business. Um, quick question. What's the difference between being content and being happy? So which one is last longer? So can you be, con like, this is what you're saying. I think you're hitting it right on the, uh, Yeah. 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 That's, that's good. I mean, and that's that's not a question we're gonna go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, that's not a question we're gonna answer today because I think everybody's trying to answer that question for themselves. But when you're thinking about getting a job, when you're thinking about what you're gonna be doing for forty plus hours a week. Um, yeah, some people just don't, they're just like, all right, I've got to make money so I can be happy on the weekends. Or I need to make money and be happy for seven days a week. They just want to have 
what makes you content and, and happiness is the, the temporary state of, you know, all right, I'm happy. But if you can get to contentment, you will have more moments of being happy. That's what I've found. All right, what is rich? So it's not the money, it's what you do with the money, right? So the Gary Keller who owns Keller Williams, um, he's a billionaire, self-made billionaire. And his whole purpose in life is to have people that work for him make a profit so they can do w good in their communities. Like so, and that's a, a giant mission. He's got 180,000 people now that his mission is to have every one of them do good in their local communities. And he's rich. So is that a bad thing, that he's rich? No. Two mindsets. So this is kind of where, if you can get over, and I'm not rich, like, I mean, I've got, been successful. I've got earned some time with other people making me money, like 18 people on the team out there doing their push-ups. I've got five closings today that I just learned about that when I was walking out the door. You know, so I've got time so I can come and you know, talk to you guys and, and do other things. So um, I feel rich, but this, you know, the guy yesterday who came and spoke to my, my team sold his business for $115 million. Just crazy money. He's rich. I was on his boat. Um, he just bought a yacht for 40 million, and but we're pulling it. We're we're pulling. I got a ride for a week on it. It's fantastic. Um, we're pulling in to a harbor, and his was the small yacht. Like, so I mean, there's so many different levels of rich, but it gets back to the question: Are they content? They're trying to buy happiness, but are they content? So I do think that a rich mindset and a poor mindset will help you figure out how to get time, how to get your time back. All right. So this is very, might be, I don't know if it's drastic or whatever, but we're talking about money, which is important. Rich people make their money from, make their money work for them, whereas poor people work for money. Poor people work for money all day long. They work their entire life to earn money. If they stop working, they won't get paid. Unfortunately, that is the reality. Rich people believe in learning through new things, whereas poor people believe in learning ends after college. Rich people are goal-oriented. They are willing to learn new things. Rich people are creators, whereas poor people are consumers. Rich people have a creator mindset. They're continually looking forward to creating value for each other or for other people. Rich people think long-term, whereas poor people think short-term. So number four, what would be an example of thinking long-term versus short-term? You guys are young kids, what's an example? So short-term would be thinking, I need to pass this test that's coming up in a week, or even I need to pass all my classes, but long-term will be how will passing all my classes in high school help me uh, find a good career in the future? So if we boil that down, you've got a test tomorrow, you've got your your friends going out to the movies or something. Short-term decision would be go to the movies. Long-term decision would be study for the test. Right? So Right. So it's it's the the short-term versus long-term decisions. Rich people find solutions whereas the poor find excuses. Rich people never complain. Well, I don't know about that, but they're continually looking for answers. Poor people focus on things they can't control instead of seeking things they can control. Like, so there's a lot of good stuff in this. It's kind of black and white as far as rich and poor, but um, I think some of the concepts are, are there. I come in contact with a lot of people during the year, and I can tell people that are you know, victim-oriented, everything's happening to them, and people that are solution-oriented. You know, there's something that's happened that no one can control, and they're saying, all right, how do we fix it? Like, every deal has a problem. Every, every, there's going to be problems. It's like, are you going to point to something that's gone wrong, or are you going to point to something that can fix it? And that's a decision that you guys have to make. Do you want to be the complainer or the person that 
gets out there in front of it and solves problems. And this is saying if that'll have an effect on your rich or poor. So classify the following decisions, rich mindset or poor mindset, buying name brands, stretching for your first car, extravagant gifts, gifts, toys, treasures, trips, college, lawnmower, shovel, threw those two in at the end. You can make money with the last two. Time, screen time, reading books, spending time with buddies, spending time with a mentor, grunt work, learning a trade, college. That's all time. All right, look to your left and then look to your right. <laughs> The person you will be in five years is based on the books you read and the people you surround yourself with today. I found this so true in my business career. I started real estate here in Wolfboro. This is where I knew, um, I knew all the streets, I knew the schools, all that kind of stuff. So I had some knowledge that made early success for me. <coughs> um, I would go outside of Wolfboro, so I'd go down maybe to Boston, look at the realtors down there, say, oh, these guys are doing some pretty cool things. Let me bring that back to Wolfboro and improve my business, which I did. And things were going along well. 2012, I think I was number nine in the state, selling a good amount of real estate, but just kind of trying to figure it out on my own. I joined a new company, Keller Williams, and they forced us in room, they didn't force us, but you know, we went to rooms like conventions and I would go into a room with somebody who was in say Naples and they did a, about the same business. So we had the same problems. We had the same things that were going well and we, we call it masterminding. So everybody would get together and mastermind on how to improve their business. But what that also did was I went down to a convention and I would think at that time I was number one in the state and I was with the guy from Maine, Troy, who was number two in Maine, and we're looking at the panel, and these guys are just selling massive amounts of real estate. And I looked at Troy, I said, do you feel like a high school hero right now? Like, there's so many levels of success that if you limit yourself by the people you hang out with, like if I just stayed in Wolfboro, did my time during the week, and then, you know, on the weekends, goofed off or whatever, and didn't actually go outside of my area, outside of my, my comfort zone to hang out with these people, my horizon would be here and I'd be fine with it. Like, the hardest change isn't going from bad to great, the hardest change is going from good to great. Like, there are good companies out there and like when I'm recruiting to, to Keller Williams and somebody's at a good company, it's hard to get them to come over because everything's good, there's no reason for the change. So, um, until you surround yourself with people that are great, that have, achieve the things that you want to achieve, have goals and you know, ambitions that you have similar goals and ambitions, you're not going to be able to achieve at a high level without the people around you. Uh, three key relationships that I try to keep is somebody I'm learning from, like the guy yesterday, um, I call him every once in a while. Once COVID hit, I called him up, I said, Tim, what do you do with expenses? We get this pandemic that's hitting you know, what, are you, what decisions are you going to make? And he told me, he said, I've already made those decisions. Every year, I've got DEF CON. So we have, if it's DEF CON 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, if sales go to this level, that's DEF CON 4, we cut these people. They've, he's already pre-decided you know, what's gonna happen at certain levels. So when a crisis hits, he's not making decisions in a crisis moment. So for me, because I reached out to him, it helped me implement in my business a similar scenario, which, you know, beginning of the pandemic, we didn't know if sales were gonna go to zero. Very scary time. And I, as a company owner, decided, all right, I'm not gonna fire anyone. They've been loyal to me, and I'm not gonna take my foot off the gas marketing-wise. That was just kind of business decisions. Because I wrote a paper, kind of a position paper, on why New Hampshire's a good place to live, and why we all live here. So it's kind of betting on the fact that we might come out of this okay, 
I didn't know everything was going to go crazy and double, but we were braced for that because we were still doing the money-making activities. I renegotiated some of the deals, and in negotiation, you always ask. So I went to a, a, my website provider. I said, listen, I want to be loyal to you. We don't know what's going to happen in the pan pandemic. What can you do for us? And they cut our bill by a third. I was going to ask for 10%, so I always make somebody else go first in a negotiation. Um, so you know, that was from my learning from relationship, a mentor, you know, teachers, things like that. Learning with, that's the people you hang out with. That's the group of, I have a group of 10 people that are all top realtors in New Hampshire, I mean in, in New England, that we get together once a month and just ch talk. We're learning from each other. And always somebody you're teaching. If you want to learn something, teach it. Right? If you want to learn, like in real estate, wealth building, you know, all of these things. The, I was in um, Texas. It was the top 200 people in all of Keller Williams, so it's a pretty powerful real estate room. And still there, we're talking about, all right, you know, we, I wanted to learn more about goal setting, so I taught about goal setting. So if you want to really learn something, try to teach it. Any comments on this? Anyone going to change their friends? Yeah, no, and that's a very cut and dry slide. I just put it in there to just kind of jar some like emotional thought to it. But rich could be rich in you know authentic relationships, rich in time, rich in money, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so yes, I mean that's just it could be a blend of both. Yeah. It is. I mean, for, uh, and that's the reading of the books. Like, so I hate reading. So everybody who's in here that says, you know, I just don't like to read. I used to have a sticker on my, um, my radio that I got from a book club that came in the mail. It says like, I want a free book every month or I don't read. It hurts my brain. Like I had the sticker. It hurts my brain. Um, so it's not naturally something that I like to do. Welcome back sophomores. Um, so, but I know, and I, this is what I wish, this is what I could have told my 20 year old self, um, did I mess it up? is, is read more books. So it's the, it's the, the learning. Um, and so I've got just like five books. What do I have about 10 minutes or five minutes, six minutes. Okay. Psychology money. So if you think about a doctor, they do a lot of studying, they do a lot of learning, and they become a good doctor. If you think about a carpenter, they do a lot of studying, they do a lot of learning, a lot of other on the job training. If they do that, they're probably going to become a good carpenter. Um, money, there are very, very smart, well schooled, uh, well practiced poor people. And there are a lot of people that have a low IQ um, and you know, not a lot of study in money that are rich. Like the psychology of money just gets into how money is just this, this thing that's so hard to figure out. Like my parents lost a whole subdivision. I'm in real estate. Subdivisions still scare me. Like just because I, I lived it when I was your age, actually. So I thought I was gonna get a lot. I thought I was gonna get, you know, money from this subdivision the economy crashed. So I have a different psychology around subdivisions than somebody whose parents did a subdivision and made a whole bunch of money off of it. So that's what this book is all about. And so Audible is your friend if you don't like re reading. Rich Dad, Poor Dad, this is like the staple of people that want to think about if I want to be intentional about making money, if I want to be intentional about being Carter, you know, getting the $8. Carter was in the I phase. He was an investor. I have to work on Troy because he was an employee. Like, not that any of this is bad, because you can, you can have a really good job that gives you a lot of money, but it's what you do with the money because you can turn yourself into an investor. Like, you can still do what you love. You can still have a, a job that gives you fulfillment, and you can have an investment business on the side. So. Eventually, you're working because you want to, because, not because you have to. So, rich dad, poor dad, if you Google that, that's all over the place. <clears throat> Atomic habits, 
This is just if you want to form habits. Uh, I recommend this book. It's a very easy read. Uh, the, the quote that I really like, uh, you, do, you do not rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems. So when you get into a crisis, you go back into your habits, you go back into your modes. Everybody's got habits, we just don't know if they're good or bad. The one thing, this is a, kind of like the habit books, it's got a 66 day challenge that if you want to create a habit, it's got the, actually 66 blocks to say you're, you're achieving it and after 66 days, hopefully you've implemented the habit. But it, basically the premise is, is to do the, the most important thing first. Like if you make a to-do list for a day, that's, that's good because you can start checking off stuff, but you should take the top four and do those first. So rearrange your to-do list into these are the things I have to do before I run out of steam. There's a great thing in this book that talks about judges in England. So it tracked the guilty verdicts. So if you're coming up before the judge and they were trying to decide if you're guilty or not, if you got in front of the judge like at 9 to 10 o'clock in the morning, the guilty, and I don't know the exact, I'm going to make up the, the percentages, but the verdict was not guilty like 60% of the time. And then as you got closer to lunch, the judge, like it was like 90% because the judge was getting hangry. And so the poor people that came before and right before lunch got the guilty verdict. And then it kind of, after lunch, went down a little bit. And then towards the end of the day, that's when you really didn't want to be in front of the judge. So this talks about working with that. If there's something that you don't want to do, do it first. When you have the energy, you've got the stamina, like how many people wake up and say, all right, this is the day I'm going to exercise. And then you exercise or eat well or, or whatever. Um, it's so much harder to work out at night. Emotional intelligence. This is a book about how people understand themselves in order to manip manipulate the wrong word, but it's probably the most powerful word. If you're in a relationship and you want to understand yourself and other people, this is a way to gauge that. <laughs> is that it? All right. Thanks for coming.